The lasting point of contention after the financial crisis of 2008 was that not only the banks were too big to fail, but everyone at them was apparently also too big to jail. But all right, if jailing a banker for playing around with credit default swaps was too difficult, surely something as simple as laundering terror money is easier to prosecute, right? Well, you'd be surprised, because as we saw with the scandal at HSBC in 2012, even laundering astronomical sums of money for groups like Al-Qaeda and the Sinaloa cartel won't generate anything beyond a fine from government regulators. In the words of the nation's highest, second highest prosecutor, pressing criminal charges would have threat, or had the U.S. authorities decided to press criminal charges, the future of the institution would have been under threat and the entire banking system would have been destabilized. Well, one person, though, noticed increasingly alarming behavior at HSBC and blew the whistle, doing what he could to help the government. His name is Everett Stern. And after all these years, he is shocked by how the big bank got away with financing the enemy with the government's support and permission. Stern is now the CEO of Tactical Rabbit, an intelligence consulting firm. And earlier, he joined Sean Stone to take us through the backstory of this fascinating case. I want to start by discussing how you broke into national prominence actually in 2012 with this massive HSBC money laundering scandal. They were laundering billions of dollars and essentially laundering it for various terror groups around the world. And at the end of the day, they were slapped with about a under $2, $2 billion fine, which was a lot of money, but in comparison to what they were laundering, minute. Tell us a bit about what you discovered while you were working at HSBC. Sure, I mean, so I, I started at HSBC in October of 2010. Um, I was 25 years old, and um, yeah, I mean, I just saw massive uh, money laundering going to Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, drug cartels, um, and you know there were maybe 15 compliance officers in the whole department when I started, um, and it was just completely understaffed. Like there were like folded up cubicles, and the walls were half painted and this was in like a shopping mall facility uh, in Newcastle, Delaware. And actually half the building was full of all these debt collectors for, for, for Capital One for the HSBC credit card. Um, and what, 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 I, what I saw that what was very, very important, which the FBI later called stripping the payments, was a criminal manipulation of the wire filter. So there's certain names that OFAC bans, uh, certain companies and uh, businesses that, that, and people we can't do business with, and they're listed in an actual filter. So for instance, if you have, the, the prime example is this company called Tajico, T-A-J-C-O, um, which is a front for Hezbollah uh, operating out of um, um, uh, Beirut, and they're operating different supermarket chains called Kariba Supermarkets um, out of uh, Gambia and Sierra Leone. Um, and so in the wire filter, when a wire comes in, if it says Tajiko, it will get stopped. Um, but what HSBC, what these geniuses figured out, was if they add little dots or dashes to the actual name, the payment wouldn't match and the payment would go through. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, I caught what they were doing, because I was like, well, how are all these payments going through when they're supposed to be stopped? And then th that's when I realized this was a absolute criminal uh, operation. And later on, actually, what they ended up doing was uh, firing all these debt collectors in the other side of the building, I mean, h hundreds of them. And then they rehired them as anti-money laundering compliance officers uh, with no AML experience, nothing, and they just had them clearing transactions all day long. Um, but, but again, going back to your question, I, I, I saw there, there was an emergent national security issue uh, that needed to be addressed. Um, and uh, I couldn't go to the FBI because they hired a former counterintelligence FBI agent to run the department. Uh, he was specifically hired, I believe, to defraud the United States government. Um, and so on three weeks in from my employment, uh, um, on November 12th, 2010, that's when I emailed uh, the CIA regarding these these transactions and issues. I emailed my former recruiter. I was rejected from the CIA before I joined HSBC. Um, and um, yeah, and the only thing I can say though is that I think that this counterintelligence FBI agent that HSBC hired uh, needs to go back to the academy because I got, I, I got past his intelligence for over a year by passing information to the CIA <laughs> the whole time I was there and built up this huge case. So that guy needs to be retrained. But at the end of the day, this wasn't just HSBC employees trying to make money by allowing basically various uh, 
blacklisted you know, group companies and groups to, to do their financing. This is ultimately coming from the top down, no? Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Absolutely. This was a top-down approach, um, and they were designing a system to defraud the government and to facilitate funds uh, to, to benefit terrorist organizations and drug cartels. And what the, what the government did by just finding them $1.9 billion, which was only five weeks of their profit, was to say, okay, this is just a cost of doing business, and that's it. Mm -hmm. So when people ask me, is HSBC still doing this now, my answer is yes, because the, the system wasn't put in place for this to happen, and no one went to jail. So someone was supposed to go to jail, but the administration was afraid to cause a financial crisis, um, and people in power had a lot, at the time, had a lot of ties to HSBC, such as Jim Comey uh, with the FBI. Um, he, I mean, he was a former board member of HSBC. Um, uh, Loretta Lynch, uh, Eric Holder, there, there were certain ties to HSBC, um, and it just prevented an actual prosecution. Mm -hmm. and, and again, you have to remember, Sean, HSBC admitted to financing the enemy. This is what they admitted to. I mean, everything I'm saying and have said about HSBC has been proven true because HSBC has admitted everything. Um, and they admitted it as part of the deferred prosecution agreement. Um, but again, financing the enemy. I mean, I don't know about you, but if I finance the enemy, they'll hang me in Times Square. I mean, right. it's, it, you know, it's, that, it's a death sentence. Um, if you donate $1 to Hamas or Hezbollah, you go to jail for life. Mm -hmm. These guys get a bonus. Precisely, and the thing is that HSBC actually has a very long history of, of engaging in money laundering, uh, especially around drug trafficking because of the opium wars. Frankly, it was a British bank. It had to do with the origins of um, Hong Kong and, and Shanghai uh, banking apparatuses. So Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, always from the start, was actually involved in laundering opium money from the opium wars that the British had fought against the Chinese. So there's a long history here. but. And you're, you're saying it's a top-down operation that obviously continues, and you say it's uh, aiding the enemy. But at the end of the day, it seems to me that the, uh, the, the entire nature of the financial fabric of our world, especially the Western world, is actually girded by the underworld. It's essentially, we, we would, they would argue Wall Street needs the money from drug profits, from arms deals, and all kinds of illicit things, because that's still circulating back into the lifeblood of our functioning economy. Sure. Um, I don't know. It's hard for me to, to comment on, on that because I haven't. I've only seen it in HSBC's case, um, and I don't think though that. Well, I can't comment on it. I, I don't think with, with that that Wall Street or the banks need the, this this terrorist financing or drug cartel financing money to operate. There, there are plenty of ways in, in capitalism to make uh, significant cap money or your capital ethically. Um, and and I, I think, though, what the problem is is not Wall Street or the banks, actually, or bankers, for that matter. I think what the problem is is this, is this, is, it, is, the, is the message that government is sending by saying, you know what, if you're a whistleblower, you get a reward. Or if, if you, you know, launder money, then you just get a fine. And I, I think they're removing and they're lessening the actual moral responsibility of these financial institutions in the United States. So I, I think the, the problem is needs to be hit at, at the source. Mm -hmm. And I think what the real source of the problem is individuals taking personal responsibility and making sure that, that they're doing the right thing and if they're not if, and if something's not going right that they report it not because they're going to get a reward or something but because it's the right thing to do mm -hmm. so I think I think society in general has moved away from this personal responsibility and just said eh, we'll get a fine or we'll get this and that when well, precisely. I mean, the whole point is that the government has allowed and perpetuated this entire uh, environment that there is no no culpability, right? If you're too big to, j to jail, too big to fail, as you said, then the DOJ is not going to go after HSBC, not one person um, indicted or, you know, or jailed or any prosecuted for, obviously, money laundering to various drug cartels and terrorist groups. As you said, most people who are who don't have the protection of massive bank behind them would be in jail for it. But obviously, we're, they're creating a culture, which is to say, as long as the money keeps flowing, 
we really don't care what you do. Right, and, and, and it's interesting. I mean, how the government is 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 kind of ben is benefiting off of this these these whistleblowing rewards and and they're um, you know people who should not. Like I don't consider myself a whistleblower. I'm not a whistleblower because a whistleblower is somebody who literally blows the whistle or alerts somebody and then stops and then that's it. They just walk away. I'm I mean I'm more of a fighter. I mean th that I've been fighting for for years, I mean, even to my own detriment, to, to try to change the culture and try to and try to create positive, significant change on society by getting the message out. I'm not sure people are listening, but. I, th I've been trying. Well, how did the media respond uh, to you when you were coming out basically with your report? And obviously this whole case was ongoing. How was the media's response and the, the sort of the ultimate apathy that the media seems to have when, okay, you get $2 billion fine, the media cheers, but meanwhile you have to scratch your head and go, is that really finding culpability for this the level of uh, criminality? Yeah, no, no. And, and, and the media completely, they gave me a very hard time. I mean, uh, you know, I, I mean, it was amazing. I mean, for instance, I, I did uh, um, an interview before um, the deferred prosecution agreement. I, I did a, um, in the Senate hearings, uh, I did a uh, one hour feature interview with Brian Ross with ABC News. Um, and he said to me, Everett, it'll, it'll be out in two weeks, shook my hand, and the guy never aired it. Um, and uh, I think Brian Ross did a huge disservice, and ABC News did a huge disservice to the United States. Um, because again, everything I said in that interview proved to be true, and unfortunately, the media needed to report on this story because most of the American public don't know what HSBC is. They've never heard of HSBC or this money laundering scandal. I mean, it's very under underreported, uh, and I think a lot of people don't care about it. Not not because they. Not out of pure apathy, not the American public, but it's just because they simply don't know. Mm -hmm. But you're right, though. The, the the media has shown extreme apathy and and just lack of um, you know reporting integrity um, in, in, when, in regards to this story. Mm -hmm. Good news travels fast, though not always accurately, like today when many outlets reported that the FDA is about to approve the first U.S. gene therapy. But despite many clickbaity headlines to the contrary, this is actually not the first gene therapy that could be approved by the FDA because it's not really gene therapy. See, gene therapy is replacing a bad gene with a good copy of a gene or introducing a new gene into the body. This treatment, which is pretty amazing, takes your own, your body's own superpower filled cells and uses them to kick cancer. The treatment known as chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy takes T cells collected from leukemia patients that are then grown in a lab to produce chimeric antigen receptors, which when introduced into the patient's bloodstream attack and kill cancer cells. It's pretty amazing.